Well, the World Bank has one primary aim, and that's to make other countries dependent on American agriculture. Uh, this is built into its uh, Articles of Agreement. Uh, it can only make uh, foreign currency loans. So it will only make loans to countries uh, for agricultural development uh, roads uh, if it is to promote, promote exports. Uh, so the United States, uh, has, uh, through the World Bank, has become, I think, the most dangerous uh, right-wing evil organization in modern history, more evil than the IMF. It, it's, uh, it is, that's why it's all, almost always been run by a secretary of defense. It has always been explicitly military. Uh, it's, it's the hard, hard fist of American imperialism. Its idea is that uh, if we'll make uh, Latin American and African and Asian countries export plantation crops, uh, uh, large, uh, especially plantations that are uh, foreign-owned. Uh, but uh, the primary directive of the World Bank to countries is you must not feed yourself. You must not grow your own grain or your own food. You must depend on the United States for that, uh, and you can pay for that by exporting plantation crops. I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. Here at Moderate Rebels, we talk a lot about imperialism. I mean, it's really the kind of main point of this show. This program explores how U.S. imperialism func functions, how it works on the global stage, how neoliberal policies of austerity and privatization are forced at the barrel of a gun through the U.S. military, through invasion and plunder. We talk about it in Venezuela and Iraq and Syria and so many countries, but we often don't talk about the specific economic dynamics of how it works through banks and loans and bonds. Well, today we are continuing our discussion with the economist Michael Hudson, who is really one of the best experts in the world when it comes to understanding how U.S. imperialism functions as an economic system, not just through a system of military force. Of course, the economics are maintained, they're undergirded by that military force. And we talk about how the military, military force is, is expressed through regime change wars and military interventions. But Michael Hudson also explains how the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and the U.S. financial system and banks and Wall Street, they all work together hand in glove with the military to maintain that financial chokehold. He spells this all out brilliantly in a book called Super Imperialism, The Economic Strategy of American Empire. He originally wrote that book back in 1968 and then recently updated it in 2002, published again in 2003 with the, of course, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan and kind of updated and showed how even though the system that he detailed 50 years ago, I mean, 50 years ago at this point, it hasn't really changed, but it has shifted in some ways. So today we're going to talk about how that Inter international imperialist system dominated by the U.S. works. Michael Hudson, who in the first part of this interview talked about the scheme that is the coronavirus bailout. If you want to watch the first part, you can go find that at moderaterebels.com. It's on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, any other platform. Michael Hudson is, of course, an economist, and he's also a longtime Wall Street financial analyst. He is also a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and you can find his work at michael-hudson.com, which I will link to in the show notes for this episode. So without further ado, here is the second part of our interview with Michael Hudson. I think it's a good transition point to talk about another kind of scam you've identified. There's a really um, hilarious aside in the second preface to your book, Super Imperialism, where Herman Kahn um, 
who is, I guess, I think he was the founder of the Hudson Institute, which you yeah. went to work for. He was also the inspiration for the Dr. Strangelove character in Stanley Kubrick's <laughs> uh, film. Herman Kahn is now, you know, there's an award that the neocons give out every year named for him. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is a recent award winner, but he was, he uh, was uh, in the audience or on a panel for one of your talks where you laid out your theory of super imperialism and how the United States actually gets other countries to subsidize its empire and is able to um, expand and carry out um, this massive imperial project without having to impose austerity on its own population as other countries uh, have to do under IMF control. So Herman Kahn comes up to you after the talk and says, you actually identified the ripoff per uh, perfectly and your book starts selling like hotcakes in DC, uh, I guess among people who work for the CIA and people who work in the, in the uh, military intelligence apparatus. Um, you know, I think this, said, yeah. We've built the greatest ripoff in history. We've gone way beyond anything the British Empire ever thought of. He said, that's a success story. This is not, uh, most people think imperialism is bad. You've shown how it's the greatest success story. We got a free lunch forever. Right, <laughs> right. So so, so ex, ex, explain the, the ripoff you identified there and how it is being perpetuated under the Trump administration in ways that, um, I think are pretty amazing, including through uh, the imposition of unprecedented sanctions on something like one third of the world's population. Well, I wrote Super Imperialism in 1972, uh, and it was published exactly one month after President Nixon took uh, America off gold in August of 1971. And the reason he took the um, America off gold was uh, um, the entire balance of payment deficit from the Korean War to the Vietnam War was military in character. Uh, and uh, every time, uh, especially in the 60s, uh, the more money that America would spend in Vietnam and Southeast Asia, all this money had to be spent locally, and uh, the banks were all French banks, because it was Indo French Indochina. Uh, uh, all the money would be uh, sent uh, to Paris, uh, to the bank's head offices, uh, turned over uh, uh, in, from dollars into francs, and uh, General de Gaulle would uh, end up with all these dollars, and he would every month send in the dollars and want payment in gold. Uh, and uh, Germany would do the same thing. Uh, and so uh, is the more America fought militarily, it was depleting its gold stock till finally, in August 1971, it said, we're going to, we've been using gold as our world, the key to our world power ever since World War I, when we put Europe on rations. So uh, what we're going to, we're going to stop uh, paying gold, they closed the gold window, and uh, most of the economists were all saying, oh my heavens, now it's going to be a depression. But uh, what I said was, wait a minute, now that other countries can no longer get gold from all this military spending, and when you talk about the balance of payments deficit, it's not the trade deficit, it's not foreign investment, it's almost entirely military in character. Uh, so all this, this money that we spent abroad, how are we ever going to get it back? Well, for, uh, when the these dollars we'd spent around the world, mainly for the 800 military bases uh, and the other uh, uh, activities we have, these dollars would end up in foreign central banks. And foreign central banks, what are they going to do with them? Well, we wouldn't let uh, foreign central banks buy American industries. We would let them buy uh, stocks, but not a majority owner. Uh, uh, my uh, former boss, at, uh, the man who taught me all about uh, the oil industry at Stan Standard Oil, uh, became undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs. And uh, when Herman Kahn and I went to the White House, he said, we've told the Saudi Arabians that they can charge whatever they want for their oil, but all the money they get, they have to recycle to the United States. Mostly they can buy treasury bonds so that uh, uh, we'll have the money to keep on spending, but they can also buy stocks or they can do what the Japanese did and buy junk real estate and lose their shirts uh, <laughs> on it. So basically, uh, when America spends money abroad, uh, central banks really don't have much, they don't, they don't speculate. Uh, they don't uh, buy companies, they buy treasury bonds. So we run a military deficit, the dollars are spent abroad, the central banks lend them back to the treasury, and that finances the 
is a budget deficit, but it also finances the balance of payments deficit. So we just keep giving paper. And uh, I think uh, President Bush, uh, George W. Bush, said, well, we're never really going to repay this. They get counters, uh, but we're not going to repay it. So and um, as a matter of fact, you have Tom Cotton, uh, a senator uh, from, I think, Alabama, saying, well, you know, China holds savings of $2 trillion or so in U.S. Treasury bonds. Why don't we just not pay them? They gave us the virus. Let's just grab it and nullify it. Uh, we can nullify uh, 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 Iranian assets, uh, Venezuelan assets. Uh, you know, we can. it's like a, you, a bank can just wipe out uh, the deposits that you have if it wants militarily. So the United States doesn't have any constraint on military spending. Now, uh, Herman and Khan and I on another occasion went to the Treasury Department and we talked about what the world would look like on a gold standard. And I said, well, gold is a peaceful metal. If you uh, have to pay uh, in gold, no country uh, with a gold standard can afford to go to war anymore because a war would be entail a foreign exchange payment and you'd have to pay this foreign exchange in gold, not IOUs, and uh, you'd uh, end up going broke pretty quickly. Well, needless to say, I think someone from the Defense Department said, that's why we're not going to do it. <laughs> Here's an example. Let's, let's suppose that you uh, went to a grocery store. Uh, you decided, okay, you go to the grocery store and you uh, buy, you sign an IOU for everything that you buy. You go to a liquor store, IOU. You buy a car, IOU. Uh, and uh, the IOUs will pay, pay up. You get everything you want just for an IOU. And uh, people try to collect the IOUs and you say, well, you know, no, that IOU isn't for collecting from me. That, you trade it among yourself. You know, you can trade it among yourself, you'll get rich in no time. Uh, but treat it as an asset just as you treat a dollar bill. Well, you'd get a free ride. You'd be allowed to go and write IOUs for everything, and nobody could ever collect. That's what the United States position is, and that's what it wants to keep. And that's why China, Russia, and other countries are trying to de-dollarize, try to get rid of the dollar, uh, and are, are buying gold uh, so that they can uh, settle uh payments deficits among themselves in their own currency or currencies of friendly countries, but just avoid the dollars altogether. My, Michael, in, in the first part of this interview, when we were talking about the coronavirus bailout and the $6 trillion that were just basically given to Wall Street, um, you mentioned that that basically this is just, I mean, well, I also said it too, that it's just a con scheme, but you said, you know, really that a lot of people are surprised that they don't think the system can work this way because it just seems so blatantly stacked against them, so blatantly unfair. Um, in your book, I mean, super imperialism is just so mind blowing because in simplistic terms to someone who's definitely a non-expert like me, it just becomes so clear that as you put it, the the U.S. for decades since the end of World War II has been has been really obtaining the largest free lunch ever achieved in history. The way you put it, I'm going to read just two paragraphs here really quickly from your book, and then and then maybe ask you to unpack exactly how this works. But right in, right at the beginning, um, in in this is the the updated version of your book, and and we'll link to your book in the show notes for this show. So anyone, I would highly recommend anyone listening could go buy Super Imperialism. I'm going to be uh, uh, republishing it uh, uh, under uh, through my own institute. So I, 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 it's, it's very hard to get the book. That's why I'm buying the rights back because it's really not uh, marketed in this country very much. So uh, at any rate, it, it's on my website and you don't have to buy the book. You can go to my website and get many of the chapters. Excellent. Well, I'll, I'm going to link to your website um, in the show notes. That's michael-hudson.com. And thank you for putting that up because um, it's, yeah, I've been reading the PDF and it's incredible. But so you write in, in the, the introduction to the new updated version, which you wrote in 2002 on the eve of the invasion of Iraq. You wrote, quote, the Treasury bond standard of international finance has enabled the United States to obtain the largest free lunch ever achieved in history. America has turned the international financial system upside down, whereas formerly it rested on gold, central bank reserves are now held in the form of U.S. government IOUs that can be run up without limit. 
In effect, America has been buying up Europe, Asia, and other regions with paper credit, U.S. Treasury IOUs, that it has informed the world it has little intention of ever paying off. And there is little Europe or Asia can do about it except to abandon the dollar and create their own financial system. So this seems to me as an outsider to be totally insane, to be a total con scheme. Can you explain how that scheme works? And especially in light of neoliberal economics, I mean, I took just in college basic introductory economics classes that were mandatory especially microeconomics and in those classes they you know teach you this neoliberal libertarian form of economics and they teach you the famous Winston Churchill quote quote there is no such thing in economics as a free lunch but you're pointing out that actually on the international stage this whole thing is just all a giant free lunch for the US empire well, the whole financial economy is a free lunch. And if you're going to get a free lunch, uh, then you protect yourself by saying there is no such thing as a free lunch. Obviously, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it does not want to make itself visible. It wants to make itself invisible uh, as, as possible. Well, uh, most of these countries in Asia get uh, the dollars from U.S. military spending. They, uh, they say, what are we going to do with the dollars? They uh, buy U.S. Treasury bonds that finance the military spending on the military bases that encircle them. So they're financing their own military encirclement. It's a circular <laughs> flow. The United States spends dollars in these countries. The local recipients turn them over for local currency. The local currency recipients, the food sellers and the manufacturers, turn the dollars over, uh, over to the banks for domestic currency, which is how they operate. And uh, the dollars are sent back to the United States. Uh, and it's it's a circular flow that is basically military in character. And uh, mili the gunboats don't appear in your economic textbooks. I bet your price theory didn't have gunboats in them uh, or the crime sector. And probably they didn't have debt uh, in it either. Uh, so uh, if you have economics talking about uh, as if the whole economy is workers uh, spending their wages on goods and services, uh, government doesn't play a role except to interfere uh, but uh, government is 40% of GDP, mainly military uh, in character, then uh, obviously uh, economics doesn't really talk about what uh, you think of as the economy. It doesn't talk about society. It talks about a very narrow segment uh, that uh, it isolates uh, as if uh, we're talking about a small organ in the body without seeing the body as a whole economic system, uh, a whole interrelated system uh, that's dominated and controlled by the finance and real estate sector, uh, which uh, has gained control of the government. Uh, and if the finance and the insurance and military sector, uh, military industrial complex, make themselves invisible and absent from the textbook, then people are just not going to look there to say, how does that affect our life? How does that affect the economy? And they're not going to see that that's what's making the economy poor and pushing it into depression. Well, I can't give out IOUs on you know, everything because when the debt collect on my own debts, because when the debt collector comes, I don't have gunboats. I don't have, you know, machine guns. <laughs> I don't have any gun. I mean, if I wanted to get a gun, I couldn't get one because they're all bought up in uh, Virginia across the river because, uh, you know, everyone's panicking. And I'm sure they're, you know, defending themselves by like having their guns accidentally go off and shoot their dogs. But <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of what's missing as well from this theory is that if people try to collect their debt on the U.S., the U.S. can do severe damage to them militarily or otherwise. Um, I, I, I let, let, Let's like um, game this out. I mean, how do, how do you see this playing out in Venezuela where the Venezuelan government has tried to go around U.S. sanctions, has tried to to work with uh, Russia and China to sell gold. It's had something like $5 billion of assets stolen by the U.S. through sheer piracy in the past year. And now the U.S. has dispatched, um, I think, more naval ships than we've seen in Latin America or in South America um, at any time in the last 30 years. Um, you know. Well, that's the other part of uh, super imperialism uh, book, debt bondage. Uh, the, uh, Venezuela had a, uh, a U.S. installed uh, dictator, uh, right winger, some years ago, and uh, changed the law in Venezuela so that Venezuela's foreign debt, 
uh, uh, sovereign debt, when it borrows in dollars, is backed by the collateral of its oil reserves. And it has uh, the largest oil reserves in uh, 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 South America. So the United States has wants to grab the oil reserves. Just as uh, Vice President Cheney said we're going into Iraq to, and Syria to grab the oil, America would like all these oil reserves in Venezuela. How does it get the oil reserves? Well, it doesn't have to technically invade, or at least uh, finance is the new mode of warfare. It tried to grab these reserves by saying, let's uh, block Venezuela from earning the money uh, by exporting the oil uh, and earning the money from its U.S. investments to pay the foreign debt. So we're just going to grab the investment, and we're going to select a, a mini-dictator. We're going to give it to Mr. Uh, uh, one Guaido. of the Guaido. Uh, yeah, and, and Gu Guaido, and take and say this doesn't belong to Venezuela. We're we're arbitrarily taking it away, and we're giving it uh, uh, the uh, oil distribution uh, assets in North America in America to uh, uh, Guaido. We're going to block Venezuela from paying the debt, and that means it'll default on the foreign debt, and so the vulture funds and the bondholders can now grab Venezuelan oil anywhere. Uh, under international law because it's pledged as collateral for its debt, just as if you'd borrowed a mortgage debt and you'd pledged your home and the creditor could take away your home like Obama had uh, so many people lose their home. Well, now uh, they're trying to uh, force Venezuela into relinquishing its debt, but Venezuela still is managing to scrape by, and so uh, they may need a military uh, force uh, to invade Venezuela like uh, Bush invaded Panama. Uh, sort of, or Grenada, uh, trying to sort yeah. of, uh, it, it's an oil grab. Uh, so what finance couldn't achieve, finally, you really do need the military fist. And finance is basically backed by military and domestically by force, by the sheriff, by the police department. Uh, it's the force that are going to kick you out of the house. So the question is, is the only defense by the indebted people in America your Virginia event. Does there have to be an armed revolution here to cancel the debts? Do they have to eat the rich? Uh, that's the whole question for the politics of America. Uh, I don't see it being solved. Uh, if it is not solved by uh, the, in, the indebted people simply starving to death, committing suicide, uh, getting sick, uh, or emigrating, then uh, there will have to be a revolution. Uh, th those are the choices uh, between America and uh, Venezuela said we're going to have, you know, we're not going to starve quietly in the dark. Uh, and so there is uh, a military buildup pretending that it's all about drugs when uh, Venezuela is threatening to interrupt the CIA's drug trade. I mean, that's the irony of this. It's the CIA that's the drug dealer, not the Venezuelan government. So uh, we're in the Orwellian world that... Uh, 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 use uh, work through the organs of the New York Times, the Washington Post, MSNBC, National Public Radio, uh, the real right wing of America. Yeah, that, um, that's, I'm so glad you, you brought boiled it down like that because so much of what we do at the gray zone is to punch holes in the propaganda constructs that are used to basically provide liberal cover for what is sheer gangsterism that the Gee, U.S. wants. more black and white than gray. Yeah. Yeah, well, we should, yeah, we should call it the black and white zone. Um, we're seeing it as well in Syria, where we've had one kind of human rights uh, propaganda construct after another. And now at the end of the line, as the whole proxy war ends, Trump says we have to keep the troops there because of oil. We need them to guard the oil fields. So it's, it all becomes clear, but it's unclear to everyone who's been confused for the past years following the way that the war has been marketed to them through these corporate media and U.S. government publications that you just named. It, it's just, we're there for the oil. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I mean, there's there's so many ways we could explore this topic further. One of the things, I mean, and and hopefully we can have you back more often in the future because we, we definitely need more economics coverage. We frequently talk about the political side of a lot of these issues of U.S. imperialism, but of course the economic element is absolutely integral to understand what's happening. I'm also very interested, you mentioned before we started this interview that your book, Super Imperialism, is very popular in China, and that, that's, and that even in schools there, people are reading it. And I'm, the question of China, I think, is the central question of this century. The rise of China, the 
the so-called threat that China poses in scare quotes to the U.S. Of course, China doesn't threaten the American people, but rather the the chokehold that the U.S. has in the international financial system. And we have seen under Trump, I mean, it's been happening for years. It, it really actually began under Obama with the pivot to Asia. And that was really Hillary Clinton's State Department strategy was to move toward the encirclement of China. But now under Trump, it has really become the main foreign policy boogeyman, boogeyman of the, the Tr Trump White House, and especially now with coronavirus. Every single day, the corporate media is full of nonstop anti-China propaganda. China is the evil totalitarian regime that's going to take over the world, and we have to unite with the Republicans in order to fight against China. And we now even see figures openly defending the new Cold War, as they call it. They say we're in a new Cold War, as the right-wing historian from Harvard, Neil Ferguson, put it in the New York Times recently. So I'm wondering, you know, your your book, I think, is even more relevant now than it was when you first wrote it. I mean, it's it's so and so relevant. But But what about the question of China? And what about the question of this new Cold War? Do you think that that could challenged the U.S. dominated financial system that was created after World War II using the weapons of the World Bank and the IMF, as you spell out, are we heading maybe toward the creation of a new international financial system? Well, what makes China so threatening is that it's following the exact identical policies that made America rich in the 19th century. Uh, it's a mixed economy. Its government is providing the basic infrastructure at subsidized prices to lower the cost of living and the cost of doing business so that its export industry uh, can make money. Uh, and it's uh, subsidizing research and development, just like the United States did in the 19th uh, century and early uh, 20th century. So it's, uh, America basically says to the rest of the world, do as we say, not as we do, and not as we've done. So China has a mixed economy uh, that is uh, working uh, very well. You can just see uh, the changes uh, that are occurring there. And uh, it realizes uh, that the United States is trying to disable it, To uh, that the United States wants to control all uh, sectors of production that have monopoly pricing, uh, in, uh, information technology, a microchip technology, uh, G5. Uh, communications, uh, military uh, spending. And uh, the United States wants to be able to essentially uh, uh, buy goods from the rest of the world with overpriced exports, uh, uh, American movies, uh, anything that has a, a patent uh, that yields a monopoly price. And uh, China uh, wants to become, it's decided that America in the 1950s tried to fight uh, China by sanctioning uh, grain exports to China. Uh, you mentioned grain export uh, sanctions earlier. The first sanctions were used against China to prevent them trying to starve them with grain. Canada broke that uh, embargo for grain, and uh, uh, China was very friendly to Canada until Canada turned out to be uh, the, the prime minister. Now that he's moved into a small basement in the Pentagon uh, and has agreed to grab uh, uh, Chinese officials, uh, <laughs> they, 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 it's a small uh, right there in Washington. Canada's right there in Washington in one of the basements uh, there. It's not a really <laughs> country anymore. So it's not, uh, China does not feel so friendly towards Canada now that it's moved. Uh, but uh, it realized we can't depend on America for anything. It can cut us, us off with sanctions like it's tried to do with Iran, uh, with Venezuela, uh, with Cuba. Uh, so the ideal of uh, uh, China, Russia, uh, and uh, the countries in the Shanghai Cooperation or, uh, Organization, uh, has been, we have to be independent within ourselves and make a Eurasian trading area, and uh, we will take off because uh, we are successful in industrial capitalism evolving into socialism, into a mixed economy, with the government uh, handling all of the monopoly sectors to prevent monopoly pricing uh, here. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't want American banks to come in, create paper dollars, and buy out all of our industries. We're not going to let America do that. Uh, I've gone back to China very often, and uh, 
Uh, I'm a professor at Peking University. I have honorary professorships in Wuhan. I probably lecture mainly in Tianjin. Uh, um, uh, there are a number of articles on my website from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences on de-dollarization, uh, uh, essentially how China can avoid uh, the use of a, the dollar by becoming independent in agriculture and technology uh, and other goods. And uh, the threat of China is that it will not be a victim. Uh, victimizers always look at the victims as vicious attackers of themselves. So America says China is a vicious threat because it's not letting us exploit them and victimize them. So again, it's an Orwellian uh, rhetoric of the bully. The bully always believes that the person he's uh, attacking is a threat. Just like uh, in Germany, uh, Goebbels said that the surefire way to get mobilize the population behind any attack is to say, we're defending ourselves against foreign attack. So you have the American attack on China pretended to be defense against their wanting to be just as independent as the United States always has been. The United States doesn't want any other country to have any leverage to use over the United States. Uh, the United States insists on veto power in any organization that it'll join. The World Bank, the IMF, uh, the United Nations, uh, and China uh, wants essentially uh, says, okay, this is the very definition of national independence, to be independent from other countries available to uh, choke us off at a choke point, whether it's uh, grain that we need or technology or uh, the bank clearing system, the SWIFT uh, interbank uh, clearing system to make our financial system operate or uh, the uh, internet system. So uh, by essentially raising, waging this economic warfare uh, against China to protect American monopolies, um, America is integrating uh, China and Russia, and probably the, the leading Chinese nationalist in the world, the leading Russian nationalist, is Donald Trump. He's saying, look, boys, I know that you're uh, influenced by American neoliberals. Uh, I'm going to help you. Uh, I believe that you should be independent. I'm going to help you, Chinese and uh, Russians and Iranians, be independent. I'm going to keep uh, pushing the sanctions uh, on agriculture to, to make sure that you're able to feed yourself. I'm going to be pushing sanctions on technology to make sure that you can defend yourself. So he obviously is, a, I believe he's a Chinese and Russian agent, <laughs> just like NBC. <laughs> yeah, and Michael, this actually reminds me, um, I... I used to follow you regularly at the Real News, and I, and I worked there for a bit. And unfortunately, there was kind of like an internal coup there, and um, it's, it's moved to the right a bit. But the point is, a few years ago at the Real News, I remember you did an, an, an amazing debate between the between it was between you and the Canadian economist Leo Panitch, and it was about the nature of the BRIC system. This was when. This is before the series of coups that that overthrew the left in Brazil and installed the fascist government now of Jair Bolsonaro, a right wing extremist. And at the time, there was Dilma Rousseff, a progressive from the Workers' Party, and Brazil was help and Russia were helping to take the lead in the BRIC system. This is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And of course, the coup, the series of coups in Brazil kind of ended that that project of South-South regional integration and also the rise of the, the right wing, the far right in India with Narendra Modi. But, but there was a moment there when the BRICS community, these countries were trying to build their own bank. Um, China, of course, has a series of banks. You mentioned the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So there have been these, these international institutions, multilateral institutions created to kind of challenge the hegemony of the World Bank and the IMF. And I remember in that debate, Leo Panitch was arguing that, oh, the BRIC system and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, all of these institutions are just going to be the new form of neoliberalism, and they're just going to replace the World Bank and implement many of the same policies. You disagreed with that. So maybe can you kind of relitigate that, that debate here a little bit and just kind of articulate your position for our viewers? Well, the World Bank has one primary aim, and that's to make other countries dependent on American agriculture. Uh, this is built into its uh, Articles of Agreement. Uh, it can only make uh, foreign currency loans. So it will only make loans to countries uh, for agricultural development uh, roads uh, if it is to promote exports. Uh, so the United States uh, has 
uh, through the World Bank has become, I think, the most dangerous uh, right-wing evil organization in modern history, more evil than the IMF. It, it's, uh, it is, that's why it's all, almost always been run by a secretary of defense. It has always been explicitly military. Uh, it's, it's the hard, hard fist of American imperialism. Its idea is that uh, if we'll make uh, Latin American and African and Asian countries export plantation crops, uh, uh, large, uh, especially plantations that are uh, foreign owned. Uh, but uh, the primary directive of the World Bank to countries is you must not feed yourself. You must not grow your own grain or your own food. You must depend on the United States for that, uh, and you can pay for that by exporting plantation crops uh, that can't be grown in temperate zones like the United States. So uh, uh, China uh, and, and Russia, it, they, they're not really agricultural economies. The, the buttress of America's balance of trade balance has been agriculture. Not industry. Obviously, we don't. We've deindustrialized agriculture since uh, World War II has been uh, the foundation of the trade balance, and you need foreign dependency. The purpose of the World Bank is to make other countries' economies distorted and warped, and, and to a degree that they are dependent on the United States for their trade patterns. Uh, well, well, Michael, and, isn't it also true, though, that China has massive agricultural production? And Russia sure. produces a lot of wheat, right? Sure, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't have to base its uh, exports on uh, uh, on on agriculture to African countries. It can afford having agri African countries growing their own food supply, so that they won't have to buy American food. They can grow their own food. Imagine if if China helps other countries grow their own food uh, and grain, then uh, America's Trade surplus evaporates because that's the only advantage that America has. Uh, uh, agri right. Agribusiness. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's like that famous quote: "If if you teach a man, if you if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for one day. If you teach a man to fish, he'll eat, he'll eat for for the rest of his life." And then I think Marx didn't didn't Marx complicate that? He he also but, said, "But if you lend him the money to buy a fish, uh, then you, he ends up bankrupt, and you get to grab all his property." <laughs> yeah, I mean, we saw this play out. Clearly in Haiti, where uh, uh, they, that's a typical. That's uh, a t uh, what America has when it has a free uh, a free reign. That's exactly the Haiti story. That's absolutely terrible. I, it's and, it's and not it, even to read it. That's where I get cognitive dissonance because it's just so unfair. It's so awful to read. That the eye uh, averts the page. Yeah, I mean, this is you know just a, a, observing all of this is what kind of brought me to the point where I concluded that there had to be another uh, international financial system when I saw how Haiti's, um, Haiti was brought to its knees first with the School of the Americas graduates um, you know, staging a coup and Bill Clinton reinstalls Jean Bertrand Aristide. And so it all takes place under the guise of uh, you know, goodwill by Washington. But Aristide is forced to sign off of uh, basically sign away Haiti's domestic agricultural uh, production capacity. And the next thing you know, their rice uh, economy is wiped out and they're importing rice from Louisiana. And, you know, they all the, the, the only economy left, the only economic opportunity left is to work in these free trade zones uh, for U.S. companies. And that's just the model writ large. Um, it kind of helped lead to the next coup that removed Aristide and look where Haiti is today. So right, right. trade it yeah. means you must not protect your own economy. Only America can protect its own economy. But right. you must not. That that's free trade. Right. I mean, the going back to the JFK Seeds of Peace program, it's you know, big agro subsidies and then you bomb the uh third world with uh cheap seeds and cheap goods and then you have a migration crisis. Okay. Seeds for starvation is what the program is known as, because uh, by giving uh, low price uh, foreign aid to uh, these countries, uh, they un they under they prevented domestic agricultural development because no farmer could compete with free crops that America was given. The purpose of the uh, uh, seeds seeds for starvation program was to prevent countries from feeding themselves and to make them dependent. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, when I lived in LA, I would meet uh, families who had initially come across the border because of the seeds for, they would point, point the finger directly at seeds for starvation. They'd say, we came from rural Mexico and our, our livelihood was wiped out. So this is, I mean, this, this is a long standing program and we've seen uh, in the uh, coronavirus bailout, five times more money provided to USAID uh, for so-called stabilization programs than for hospital workers. And that's to do exactly what you just described. Um, USAID is sort of the spearhead of these programs which aim to wipe out uh, land reform programs and replace them with US aid in the form of these cheap seeds and so on, cheap bananas to Burundi every, and everywhere else. So, so do you see, I mean, through your experience in China, that Belt and Road is a genuine alternative to this model? Well, they're certainly trying to make it. By the way, what you've just described, uh, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Uh, yeah. If they, when you have the same problem occurring after 50 years, uh, it's either insanity, and we know it's not, uh, or it's the intent. You have to assume at a certain point that the results of uh, these aid programs are the intended uh, results. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the congressional testimony, Congress knows this, uh, but the media don't pick it up. Uh, in China, they're really trying to create an alternative. Uh, in, uh, they want to break free from the United States. Uh, and if uh, Trump's policies of America first continue, and uh, as he said, we have to win every deal. That means any deal we make with a foreign country, that country has to lose. So he's, he's uh, integrating the whole world and isolating the United States. And uh, when you isolate the United States, uh, China realizes that what will be isolated is the neoliberalist philosophy that is the cover story, the, the junk economics that justifies all of these destructive policies. Right. Well, 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 Michael, I mean, this this was one of our I think one of our most interesting episodes. I mean, we want to do more economics coverage. So hopefully we can talk more with you and get some more of your analysis. I guess just concluding here, my final question would be. I mentioned that the the term Cold War has been thrown around a lot. And of course, the new Cold War is going to be different from the old Cold War in a lot of different ways. And of course, Russia is not the Soviet Union at all. Russia does not have a socialist system. China's system, as you mentioned, is mixed. There are still socialist elements, but it's even China's economy is not as nearly as state controlled as the Soviet Union was at, at the peak of the Cold War. So I'm wondering, you know, it's pretty clear if you listen to the rhetoric coming from the Pentagon that great power competition, as they refer to it, is now the the undergirding philosophy of U.S. foreign policy. What is the economics of that? Because the economics of neoliberalism after the destruction of the socialist bloc and George H.W. Bush's declaration of a new world order, which is, of course, just neoliberalism and U.S. hegemony. In that period, the, the, the clear economic philosophy, the kind of guiding foreign policy was destruction of independent socialist-oriented states and forcible uh, integration of those countries into the international neoliberal economy. We saw that with Iraq. We saw that with former Yugoslavia. We saw that with Libya, I mean, which is really just a failed state. So now I think we're in a kind of new phase. The Pentagon released two years ago its national defense security strategy saying that the new goal of the Pentagon and U.S. foreign policy is to contain China and Russia. That is the stated professed goal. What does that look like economically going forward? Well, I think that's uh, quite right. Of course, it'll contain Russia and China. And there's nothing that Russia and China want more than to be contained. Uh, in other words, what they're talking about is decoupling from the, from the U.S. economy. And the U.S. will say, well, we're not going to let them uh, ha have access to the U.S. market, and uh, uh, we're not going to have anything to do with them. And Russia and China say, boy, that's wonderful. Okay, we're, we're on the same uh, wavelength there. Uh, you can contain us, we'll contain you. Uh, you go your way, we'll go our way. Uh, so uh, basically, the Cold War, uh, it's an, it was an attempt, it's neoliberalism and privatization. It's Thatcherism. It's how do we make China and Russia look like Margaret Thatcher's England or Russia in the 1990s after, uh, under Yeltsin? 
How do we prevent other countries from protecting their industry and their financial system from the United States financial system and U.S. Uh, exports? How do we prevent other countries from doing for themselves what America does for itself? How do we make a double standard in world finance and world trade uh, and uh, world politics? Uh, and uh, the result of trying to prevent uh, other countries from doing this is simply to speed the parting guest, to accelerate their uh, understanding that they have to make a break, uh, they have to be contained. In other words, uh, they have to uh, create their own uh, food supply, not rely on American food exports. They have to create their own 5G system, not let America's 5G with its spy, uh, spy portals all uh, built in. Uh, and they have to uh, create their own society and go their own way, which is what China was like before the 16th century. Uh, it was always the, the central kingdom. It, it was always looked at itself as being central and uh, independent from the rest of the world. And it's, uh, it's uh, going back to that, except it realizes that it needs raw materials from Africa and from other countries. Uh, and the question is, what, what is Europe going to do? Is Europe going to just uh, follow uh, the Thatcherite uh, deflationary uh, Eurozone policies and end up looking like Greece? Uh, or is it going to uh, join uh, with uh, Eurasia, with uh, Russia, China, and make a, uh, a, a whole uh, a Asiatic continent. Uh, that really, the Cold War really is about what's going to happen to Europe, because uh, we've already isolated China, Russia, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The question is, what will happen to Europe, and what will happen to Africa? Great. Well, I think that's the perfect note to end on. We were speaking with the economist Michael Hudson. He is a Wall Street financial analyst and a distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He's also the author of many books, and we were talking about super imperialism, the economic strategy of American empire. He has two versions of that, and we're, we will link to that book in the show notes of this episode. We will also link to his website where you can find a lot of great interviews with transcripts, his articles, and that's michael-hudson.com. Michael, thanks a lot. That, that was a really great two-part interview. I learned a lot and I think our, our viewers will benefit a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. Thanks, I hope we can fill out all the details in subsequent broadcasts. Absolutely.